Welcome to the Clinical Education Initiative podcast, Conversations with CEI, where we feature conversations with clinical experts, their experience and insights on current health issues in the areas of HIV, primary care and prevention, sexual health, hepatitis C, and drug user health. My name is Lauren Walker, and I'm the director for the Hepatitis C and Drug User Health Center of Excellence at CEI. On today's episode, we'll hear about the impact of stigma on access to and engagement in healthcare services for people who use drugs, and learn practical strategies to promote genuine, non-judgmental clinical interactions. With its identification as a federal drug policy priority in 2022, we've been hearing a lot about harm reduction lately. I'd like to start with a quick refresher so we're all on the same page. Harm reduction emerged decades ago in response to the effects of the quote-unquote war on drugs. Morbidity and mortality from drug use aren't inherent side effects of use itself. And let's face it, drugs have been used for thousands of years by many groups of people. Instead, they're a direct result of how we criminalize and stigmatize drug use and people who use drugs. So harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. It's also a movement for social justice built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. There is no universal definition of or formula for implementing harm reduction, so it incorporates a spectrum of strategies. It's practical in its understanding and acceptance that drug use and other risk behaviors exist in this world and responds in a compassionate and life-preserving manner. On today's episode, we'll discuss concrete steps to address stigma and implement harm reduction in clinical interactions with people who use drugs. It's my honor to introduce today's guest. Dr. Linda Wong is a general internist and addiction medicine specialist at the REACH program at Mount Sinai, where she directs their buprenorphine treatment program. She received her medical degree from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and completed internal medicine residency and chief residency in the primary care and social internal medicine program at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx here in New York City. Dr. Wong serves as the medical director for the Hepatitis C and Drug User Health Center of Excellence here at CEI and is also the Education and Program Committee Chair for the New York Society of Addiction Medicine, or NISAM. She is an active clinician educator interested in providing stigma-free care for people who use drugs and training current and future clinicians in drug user health. I couldn't be more excited to have you here with me today, Linda. How's your day so far? Going pretty well. Thanks, Lauren. How are you? I am also well. I want to start our conversation on kind of a low point, talking about stigma and what we're taught about people who use drugs and how that impacts a person's life. Anything that you have to share about that? Yeah, I think about this a lot, especially since my patients and the people that we see in clinic frequently encounter stigma whenever they access any kind of healthcare service. And it's unfortunate because we know that our society frequently disseminates negative messages about drug use and people who use drugs. And all of that, of course, reinforces stigma, not only at an institutional level, but also an interpersonal level. And then, of course, at a personal level, stigma can be internalized. And a few examples of what a negative message might be regarding a person who uses drugs include that person has no willpower to stop, they're criminals, they're deviant, they're going to do anything to get high, they're just here to doctor shop or they're pill shopping. They have no motivation to change. We should not give them any leeway because they're just going to take advantage of it. And the list goes on and on. And these are all examples of stigma. And it's, as I mentioned before, happening at societal, interpersonal, and individual levels. And at the societal or institution level, we know that our existing social structures can empower and privilege some at the expense of others. And our legal, governmental, and cultural institutions can perpetuate that stigma by implementing treatment guidelines that may exclude people who use drugs from hepatitis C treatment, employment. And with employment, you know, this is done through the requirement of random drug testing and drug testing at the initial point of employment. So stigma can also show up on the interpersonal level. And so when we have interactions with our colleagues, other healthcare providers, There might be stigmatizing labels used or thrown around, including the terms, quote unquote, addict or junkie or clean or dirty urine. These are commonly used. And I see this all the time when I'm reviewing our patients' medical records, for example. These terms are frequently found in hospital notes regarding patients who are probably there for another medical reason. 
and we know that they're copied forward, right? <laughs> Clinicians and other hospital staff frequently will copy forward these terms. And what also is important to mention here is that there are incredible power differences between physicians or other clinicians and patients. And this power differential is really essential for the production of stigma. And it's what I hope that we will unpack later today during this talk. And then finally, at the individual level, when someone is around and experiencing stigma constantly, they can start to believe it's true. And we know this results in lower self-esteem, lower sense of self-efficacy, and they may feel, well, you know, if everyone thinks I'm a bad person who lies all the time, I might as well be bad and continue to lie. Wow. This seems like a very silly question, but I'm wondering, hearing all of that from you, how this impacts or affects the stigmatized person who's using drugs, both in the clinical setting and in their life in general. Yeah. So as you can imagine, it does not affect that person very well at all. And on a population level, we know that this tremendously impacts access to healthcare and access to equitable healthcare. The 2022 National Survey on Drug Use and Health found that almost 50 million people aged 12 years or older who had a substance use disorder, of that number, only 24% received treatment in the past year. And reasons for not seeking treatment varied from fears that receiving it would adversely affect their job to the opinion of neighbors or community members, lack of insurance coverage or cost concerns, and also people not feeling like they might need treatment to begin with, which I'm sure is a very nuanced understanding and probably very much impacted also by stigma around drug use and treatment. Among providers, negative attitudes about people who use drugs have led to lower levels of empathy and engagement and poor outcomes, or sometimes we use the term treatment retention to discuss this. So it goes both ways. And I think ultimately it creates a situation where people who use drugs don't want to access healthcare, right? And then the healthcare providers and healthcare institutions that are supposed to be taking care of everybody in an equitable fashion don't really want to engage with people who use drugs, don't really want to take care of them in the same way. And there's just significant implicit bias and discrimination that play into those feelings. A little bit of a, a personal aside here for you, but I was in a health center yesterday and I saw a flagrant example of a client being treated in a stigmatizing way and it broke my heart. And it was the first time in a long time yeah. I had been somewhere and seen it firsthand. And it was yeah. just all of these horrible things that you're saying. And I, I felt for this person when I saw this happening. So for those of you who maybe believe this isn't out there, it is at least here in New York City and, and elsewhere. Yeah. And, you know, if I can just share another example, last week I was really affected by an experience that one of my longtime patients at the REACH program at Mount Sinai experienced. You know, he was someone who has serious medical conditions. We're in the process of working up cancer. And he has unfortunately not been able to get several diagnostic interventions in the outpatient setting. And so I coordinated with the help of hospital providers and specialists. I coordinated a direct admission to the hospital. So this is something that almost never happens. And it really means that a person can bypass the emergency room before getting admitted to the hospital in order to get these necessary procedures. And he gets to the floor and, you know, just experiences a series of events that really, I think, exemplify the stigma around people who use drugs. And one example is that he has severe chronic pain and is taking opioids for pain. He also has opioid use disorder that's been in remission for years and has been very stable on buprenorphine treatment. There was a significant delay between when he got admitted to the hospital and when he received his usual home medication for pain. And then the next day, when I went to go visit him on the floor, walking onto the unit, I felt like a palpable sense of people are watching me walk to towards my patient's room. And as I walk in, someone tells me that he's in the bathroom and that he's been in the bathroom all day. And they are sure that he's using drugs in the bathroom. And in fact, one of the patient care associates lingered next to me because he wanted to wait until my patient left the bathroom so that he could go into the bathroom to smell around and look around to confirm his suspicions. And then later, as I was talking to my patient, trying to understand how he was doing, you know, what the plan was, I hear some noise outside his hospital room. And I hear the nurse talking to a security guard whom she had just called 
because as I later learned, the nurse had smelled some smoke in the bathroom. And granted, his hospital room is a shared room, which is very common in hospitals these days. It wasn't a private room. So he was sharing that room with three other people. And she said that she smelled smoke in the bathroom and that she called security because per hospital protocol, that room needed to be searched. His belongings needed to be searched to see if there were any smoking implements. And clearly, she felt that he was the one smoking in the bathroom. And security, which is symbolically a very punitive thing and is associated with criminalization, the war on drugs, was called to deal with this issue, right? And then on top of that, there was another incident where the nurse thought that after she had given him his usual home pain medication, he had like, he used the term caught speaking, quote unquote. And I actually am not super familiar with that term. And so I kind of looked it up later. And obviously, it's a term that is oftentimes used in carceral settings to describe situations where people might hold their pill or medication in between their cheek and their gum and not swallow it, or maybe also other institutional settings, right, with patients with mental health disorders. So she used that term and then went on to say that she thought he was trying to hide it, but then later clarified and asked him what he was doing. And he said, oh, I just wanted, I didn't want to take my medication in that moment. I wanted to eat my food first and then take it. But then this term gets documented in the hospital record and his copy for us, so on, so on. So anyway, all this to say, I share this example because my patient experienced all these events. And then not even 12 hours after he was admitted, he decided to leave because he felt mistreated and dehumanized. And it's incredible because after these cascade of events, what what do we have to show for this hospital stay, right? Nothing that was done reinforced any kind of a therapeutic relationship with him. Nothing that was done actually advanced any medical care for him. He still needs to get these diagnostic interventions. And the cost to society and the cost to him personally is just tremendous. So anyway, that's my story. I can't blame him either. I think if I went in and I had that same experience, I don't know if I would have even lasted 12 hours. So moving along, is there anything that clinicians and people in general can do to change the stage? Well, I think one very easy low-hanging thing that we can do is recognize that the language we use really matters and words can really hurt people and hurt their health. So identifying and removing stigmatizing language from clinical settings can have a tremendous impact and is a really easy first step that people can take. We know from studies that stigmatizing language perpetuates biases, implicit biases, and may cast doubt on a patient or person's experience and portray them negatively. For example, casting doubt by reporting that a patient, quote unquote, claims he she has 10 out of 10 pain, thereby implying culpability or using pejorative linguistic variations. In 2010, a team of researchers in Boston asked, you know, does it really matter how we refer to individuals with substance related conditions? And I think their findings are worth sharing. Clinicians attending two separate mental health conferences were presented with a clinical vignette with identical language, except one vignette used the term quote-unquote substance abuser, and the other used the term substance use disorder, which is a DSM-5 clinical diagnosis. Then the research team asked them about the causes of the person's substance-related problem and whether they should receive more therapeutic or punitive actions, and whether they were a social threat or capable of regulating their own behavior. Interesting. What did they find? They very clearly demonstrated that even among highly trained mental health professionals, these labels of substance abuser or substance use disorder evoked systematically different judgments. So clinicians who were presented with a vignette that referred to, quote unquote, a substance abuser were more likely to see those patients as personally culpable and recommend punitive measures against them rather than therapy or treatment. The term, quote unquote, substance abuser may perpetuate stigmatizing attitudes and associate a patient's medical condition with their identity. And this in turn can imply that it's a process for which the patient is to blame or to be held responsible. And all of this, of course, impacts how we care for patients and maybe more importantly, how they perceive, trust and engage with the healthcare that we want to provide. This seems all so very simple in theory to identify stigmatizing language 
you replace it with non-judgmental terms. But it it has to be trickier than that, especially when you implement it in practice. For our listeners out there today, do you have any examples of what clinicians quote unquote should or shouldn't do or say when they interact with people who use drugs? Yes, I do. And, and, and I will clarify by saying that this is a work in progress. And I think we're always trying to identify ways that we can learn from people with lived experience and, and, and sort of understand what they're going through and incorporate language that validates their experiences without being judgmental. And, you know, I think these things change over time. But yes, I do have some examples. And the first is really, you know, acknowledging your own implicit biases. Clinicians need to be aware of their own biases. And then they must be concerned about the consequence of their biases enough to motivate some change. And here's, I think, the important part I hope I can help with today. They also need to know how to replace these biased responses with a response that is more consistent with their goal. And I think it's it's not going to be super clean or straightforward to like do this you know, in the span of a day or decide to change everything. I think it takes work and practice. And it also takes some strategic thought about maybe questioning a term that you just used and maybe talking with your colleagues and other staff like, oh, I I use this term in this encounter, but I'm, you know, I, I want to talk about it. I want to unpack like, why did I use this term? It means also second guessing yourself, right? And being open to the possibility that there is more room to go in terms of what we can improve in our clinical encounters. And, you know, we should remember that because stigmatizing language is often incongruent with the goals of altruism and patient advocacy that motivate many of us who are in the healthcare profession, there can be, there can be motivation to eliminate it. So that's hope. So what can you do? What are the recommended replacements? We need to promote open, non-judgmental communication with our patients who use drugs. And you can do that by using preferred language. Being mindful of your nonverbal communication, seeing if you can adjust the physical space you use, and talk about drug use without judgment or stigma. Easy, right? I mean, this these are these are things that keep lots of people up at night and are very hard to implement. How do you ask about preferred language? I think it can be simply as, hey, I am Linda Wong. I'm a doctor. I'm here to take care of you and address any needs you have how can I address you? Like, what is your preferred name? What is your preferred pronoun? How would you like me to refer to you? So other concrete examples of what clinicians can say or not say, or try not to say when they're interacting with people who use drugs. So make sure that you're not using any terms or language that cast blame, reinforce stereotypes, or include too many like extra details, details that are not really necessary for communicating this person's clinical diagnosis or next steps in clinical management. Of course, we want to avoid pejorative language when you might interact with patients. So using, again, those terms like, quote unquote, addict or junkie. And this counts for documentation as well. And maybe even more importantly, right, because we know that anything we document in the medical record can be repurposed and reused by other people who may, you know, even if you used it in one particular way, it doesn't mean that the other person is going to use it in the same way. So bottom line is think about things from your patient's perspective. Would you want someone else to use this label or term to describe you or your family member if you were in a similar position? I talked about avoiding terms like addict or abuser, definitely junkie and crackhead, and then using person-centered terms like person who uses drugs or person who injects drugs. This helps us remember that a person isn't defined solely by what they do. And it's as objective as possible. And you can also swap out the language you use to label behavior. For example, don't use the terms abusing or drug abuse, clean or dirty, and instead simply say use. This person uses XYZ substance. You can say the toxicology test was positive for or negative for whatever sub- uh, specified substances that might impact your clinical management or allow you to discuss and optimize a safety plan with the patients. And then finally, clinicians should really be using the terms pharmacotherapy or medication rather than medication-assisted treatment, because polls show that people associate the word assistance with weakness. And at the end of the day, the medication itself is the treatment. 
I can see a lot of do this versus do that from the clinical vignette you shared with us earlier. No shame here, gold star for Dr. Wong. It sounds like you really incorporated a lot of this into your clinical practice while some of your colleagues maybe did not. And I know this is really tricky to get into deeply in a podcast episode, but I'm wondering if you have any other clinical examples of good communication skills, a gold standard scenario. I know this patient you presented earlier maybe wasn't that scenario, but you at least were there to support him. Do you have any other examples to show how all of this works in practice? Well, I guess let me go back to that patient I talked about who was in the hospital because it's sort of been on my mind a lot. And I think about that phrase, caught cheeking a lot. And in my communication with the nurse and the providers, you know, I think that nobody really stopped to question the use of that term. And I was caught off guard because it's not a term that I hear frequently in the medical setting at all. I mean, I don't work in a hospital setting. So maybe in hospital settings, it is a little more familiar. But to be very honest with you, the there's no reason why we as healthcare professionals cannot use language that just objectively describes what is happening. I gave the patient medication. He took it out of his mouth and put it aside because he wanted to take it at a later time, right? That's what happened. But if you use this term hot cheeking with no other description or details about what happened, what is a provider supposed to think? Right. I think, you know, what ended up happening was that the nurse saw this, used the term, communicated this term and this event to the nurse practitioner who was the frontline provider. And then the nurse practitioner texted this encounter using the term that the nurse had relayed to the attending of record. Right. And then the attending of record emails me and is like, hey, Linda, I'm taking care of this patient. This is what we have, you know, planned for him, which is all appropriate. And what I asked, them to do for me. And then ends the email communication by saying, oh, by the way, my nurse practitioner just texted me that the patient was caught cheeking his pain medications, which I will remind the audience that it is his usual pain medication. He was caught cheeking, the nurse found him and that's that. And that's like how the email communication (laughs) ended. What am I supposed to think? Because I think that conveys a lot of implicit bias about who they think my patient is, right? They're casting him as a criminal who is using criminal behavior in a hospital setting. And I really think that that negatively impact impacted the rest of his hospital stay. And who knows if smoke in the bathroom was from him. When I later spoke with my patient, he said that he witnessed, first of all, he didn't have any smoking implements on him. He said that he witnessed a visitor for another patient who was in the room, right? Because it's a shared hospital room, go into the bathroom and then come out and, you know, it smelled like smoke. So everything that happens that is quote unquote, not supposed to happen in a hospital setting then gets blamed on my patient because of these terms and language that are used. And so I think it's really on us to change the narrative be mindful and thoughtful about how we talk about our patients and their behaviors, and really think about how we communicate to other hospital staff and healthcare providers who are providing treatment to our patients, really think about how to convey this in a more person-centered, neutral, non-stigmatizing way, using objective details to describe events that happen, rather than these labels and stereotypes and terms and language that are really pregnant with symbolism to negatively impact the people that we take care of. I really feel strongly, and this is clearly backed by some research studies we have, that using these terms can actually lead our patients to receive more punitive actions, which is exactly what my patient got when he went into the hospital to get interventions to diagnose a potential cancer. And he left within 12 hours, having got got none of that, But I know what he did get, which is a reinforcement of stigma and this belief that people in healthcare institutions don't want to take care of him because he is somehow less of a human being than other people. I'm so intrigued by this. You mentioned at the beginning this idea of copying forward medical records. And as I'm hearing you talk, it's almost 
showing that you can copy forward someone's stigma as well by this nurse practitioner, by all of these hospital staff. It's almost like, well, one colleague said he was doing this, so I'll just go with that. And it keeps going and going and going and snowballing, and it all lands on the one person whose fault it is definitely not. Personal thought, that's it's just so sad. Yeah. No, it's it's incredibly demoralizing. And I wish we could do better by our patients. We can. Listeners, you can do better by your patients. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You can do so many things and some things are super easy for you to implement in your clinical practice. And I hope you will consider doing them, starting by being more mindful about the language you use in clinical encounters, in real life, and also in your medical documentation. Linda, I feel like we could stay and chat about harm reduction clinical cases all day, but we are coming to the end of the episode here. And before I say thank you and send you on your way today, I'm wondering how you would summarize our conversation. If someone is just joining us now for the last five minutes here, what are the key messages that you would like them to take home today? There are three key messages that I hope that our listeners can take home with them. So one is that stigma and stigmatizing language around drug use and people who use drugs reduce access to healthcare, and severely limits engagement in healthcare services. All clinical providers, including specialists, can easily incorporate non-stigmatizing language into their clinical practice to improve communication with and about people who use drugs. And then additional steps can be taken to address stigma, including optimizing the physical environment to be more friendly and accessible, and supporting other staff to provide effective engagement and harm reduction services. And if I can add one other thing, another concrete step that could be taken that comes out of the example I shared regarding my patient who went to the hospital is that if you're able to work with hospital leadership and the community around in-hospital substance use policies, I highly encourage you to try to do that because Nobody who is in the hospital for their medical care need security to come rifle through their belongings in the hospital setting when they're sick and there to receive care for their illness. It just should not happen. And these are the policies that we need to target and change in order to make the physical environment and the the experience of being in the hospital environment more friendly for people who use drugs. Fantastic. Dr. Wong, thank you again for joining me today to talk about stigma, harm reduction, communication, and most importantly, compassion. Today's conversation has me thinking of the power of kindness and compassion, which I don't think we hear enough about in medicine. I'm thankful for the passionate clinicians like Dr. Wong who provide clinical care that follows the principles of harm reduction and hope listeners out there are encouraged by the work being done. As overdose deaths continue to soar here in New York, it's more important than ever that providers and clinical care teams take this to heart. We know that stigma negatively affects health, but we also know that approaching clinical care from a harm reduction standpoint with empathy and understanding, has the power to dismantle it. So I'll leave you all with a small call to action, asking that each of you face your day with kindness and empathy. It could save a life. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for a new episode of Conversations with CEI. Visit us at ceitraining.org and follow us on CEI social media platforms.